We've all asked ourselves at least once these fundamental questions. What is the universe? What is life? And can we influence the course of our lives in order to improve the future? The greatest philosophers have tried to answer these questions for centuries. At the dawn of the 19th century, discoveries and experiments enabled scientists to unveil the mysteries of our universe and to glimpse the enormous possibilities they offer us. Through his work on relativity, Albert Einstein enabled us to understand the mechanisms that govern infinitely large objects such as stars and galaxies. But many people are unaware that the thinker who drastically revolutionized our daily lives was the scientist Max Planck. Along with other scientists, was the initiator of the discovery of quantum physics, which defines the laws governing infinitely small particles. In addition to lasers, transistors and computers, the scope of these discoveries is so incredibly wide that it could, in the long run, enable man to improve the course of his life. But in fact, what exactly are these infinitely small particles that make up matter? The answer is amazing. On our scale, matter is made up of particles well positioned in space and assembled to form solid objects, liquids or gases. To observe the universe of the infinitely small, we must leave the world of large objects behind us and shrink billions and billions of times to a level smaller than atoms. We then enter an incredible and chaotic domain that defies common sense and where the constituents of matter have a wave corpuscle duality and whose position and velocity cannot be determined at the same time or which can be in several places at the same time. On the other hand, as soon as we observe them, we remove the uncertainty about their position and thus these waves instantly transform into particles with a determined position. You may say that's impossible, but in fact it is possible. The starting point for this observation is the experiment carried out in 1801 by Thomas Young. But first let's do the experiment of sending tiny balls towards a screen through a plate pierced with two small slits. The impact marks on the screen will consist of two coarse and parallel lines, which is normal. Well, Thomas Young made a similar experiment, but he replaced the microbeads with a light beam. By the simple yet extraordinary physics experiment, Thomas Young demonstrated that light was a wave. Well, we're going to replicate this experiment with a little bit of equipment. A small laser that can be found in shops, a mirror, a cutter and a ruler, and some cloth specs. To carry out this experiment, we will first glue two cutter blades together. We will then draw two thin lines in the tain on the back of a mirror. It remains to direct the laser beam towards the two small lines and to observe the result on the screen placed behind the mirror. He then noticed on the screen not two parallel traces, but alternate light and dark lines called interference fringes, thus demonstrating that the light was indeed a wave in the same way as the waves produced on a lake.
Between 1900 and 1905, according to the work of Max Planck and Einstein, it was discovered that light was also composed of photons, microscopic packets of waves containing the smallest possible amount of light, hence the name quantum particle. This showed that the photon was both a wave and a particle. Subsequently, several scientists came up with the idea of carrying out the same experiment as Thomas Young, but by projecting one by one photons of light onto a screen via two very fine and very close slits. And they noticed, with amazement, that the famous interference fringes appeared on the screen. This meant that each photon passed through the two slits at the same time, confirming that even one by one the subatomic particles were indeed waves. But even more extraordinary, when they observed this phenomenon using an appropriate device to study through which slit the photons passed, the impact marks on the screen were no longer interference fringes, but two parallel lines as in the case of microbeads. It was therefore obvious that these quantum objects transformed from wave to particle as if they were aware of the observation to which they were being subjected. From this point on, some physicists have hypothesized that our universe could not exist in space and time in the form of material particles without the presence of observers. But you will argue, before the existence of man observing the universe around him, the same universe has already existed for 14 billion years. That's right, but wait until you see what happens next. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh became legendary by becoming the first pilot to fly non-stop and solo from New York to Paris. The same year, scientist John Wheeler further developed Young's double slits experiment with quantum particles. He imagined a system that allowed these particles to be observed, always in waveform, just before they reached the screen. To his surprise, he saw that when observed, these waves transformed into particles as soon as they passed through the slits which means before observation in the past. In other words, observation influenced the past of these quantum objects. Therefore, according to Wheeler, what caused the development of the universe 13.7 billion years ago as solid matter rather than as waves and energy may be the fact that there would later be information gathering systems such as humans. But then, if the consciousness of living beings observing their environment can transform quantum objects into matter, could we not assume that our consciousness, desires and intentions influence the material universe around us? Well, a French scientist, René Pioche, made it the subject of his doctoral thesis. If a chick is placed next to an animal or a mobile object from birth, it regards the animal or object as its mother. René Pioche therefore conditioned a large number of chicks so that they considered a small electronic robot to be their mother. This small robot is designed to carry out random movements on the basis of an electronic circuit. 
If we attach a plotter pencil to it and place it on a sheet of paper, it will generate random chaotic patterns. René Pioche found that if the chicks conditioned by the robot were placed in a cage at a certain distance from the robot, the robot would eventually approach the chicks 2.5 times more frequently than was theoretically probable. The experiment was carried out more than 500 times with the greater scientific rigor over a period of four years with 2,500 chicks. The results showed that something related to the chick's intention or desire could influence the robot's electronic circuit. But then nothing prevents us from asking ourselves the question, could we not hypothesize that our consciousness or our subconscious mind has properties beyond comprehension that can create a favorable or unfavorable future depending on our state of mind, positive or negative? Pioneers have taken a step in this direction by imagining methods based on the conditioning of our minds that allow us through positive thinking to generate happy events. Psychologist Emile Coué was one of the first. He developed his famous Coué method based on the tireless repetition of positive sentences such as every day, on every point of view, I am getting better and better. But today, positive thinking techniques have evolved with the discovery of the importance of the subconscious. These new methods are based on sending positive messages to the subconscious or mentally visualizing happy events that we would like to experience. It's known that communication between the conscious and subconscious mind is increased when the frequency of the electrical waves emitted by the brain decreases. During periods of activity, the brain's rhythm varies from 12 to 40 hertz. By performing an electroencephalogram on a person during meditation, we can see that the frequency of brain waves decreases to 8.5 cycles per second. In the period just before sleep, this frequency goes even lower to 4.5 cycles per second. At this moment, the barrier between conscious and subconscious is very weak. It is therefore the right time to send positive messages to the subconscious or to imagine in a kind of dream positive events that we would like to see happen. Le bonheur d'exister dans cet univers extraordinaire. For convenience, these messages can be pre-recorded on tape. This technique, created by the American psychiatrist Milton H. Erickson, is also known for its action on anxiety and addiction. But with the advent of modern technologies, electronic tools have been invented that make it possible at will to reduce the frequency of brain waves. The most common devices are neurofeedback and audiovisual stimulators. Under the barbaric name neurofeedback, a small portable electroencephalograph simply measures the amplitude of the brain waves and displays them on a screen. Then the deal consists in increasing the quantity of these low frequency waves by relaxing. You can then listen to positive pre-recorded messages that will be transmitted directly to the subconscious mind. With the development of new technologies, biofeedback has taken on the appearance of this small device. You have three electrodes that will pick up the brain waves and a small box that will transmit the measurements to a smartphone or a computer by Bluetooth. The exercise will then consist in making a virtual object move in a kind of video game only 
by increasing its concentration and relaxation. I will show you how it works. In less than a quarter of an hour, you reach a serene state of modified consciousness equivalent to one hour of meditation. The audio-visual stimulator consists of a pair of glasses equipped with LEDs that pulsate at specific frequencies. After a while, the brain will adjust to the slow pulsation frequency. In this way, the barrier between conscious and subconscious is lowered. As with neurofeedback, you can then listen to pre-recorded positive messages. Vous avez maintenant conscience de la force qui est en vous. Une force qui est spontanément gérée par la nature dont vous êtes constitué. Of course, these devices are not miraculous tools that will enable us to become rich and famous without effort. Nothing will replace a positive state of mind leading to positive actions and creative visualization of a better future for all of us. As we can see, the reality around us and the course of our lives are guided by phenomena whose mysterious laws we are only beginning to glimpse. Unfortunately, these phenomena are ignored by the great mass of people. In schools today, theories developed in the 17th century are still being studied, and the extraordinary discoveries made since the 19th century, such as quantum physics and the theory of relativity, are being neglected. As a result, a huge gap is widening between the scientific elite and the people. So what about the domain that skeptics ironically call the domain of the paranormal? Should we not be scientifically studying phenomena such as the transmission of thought, premonition and all those singularities that make reasonable people smile? Could we not hypothesize that all these unexplained things may simply be physical phenomena whose laws are not yet known? <laughs> 